the efforts and the thoughts are going in the direction that, um, of course, we should not, after this crisis is over, hopefully soon, that we're not going back to the old normal. That we should really use this opportunity to look at what are what can we learn from that? How can we really integrate change in a positive way? Hello and welcome to our GCLA Leadership Talk. Today, we're going to talk with Christian Kuna, and he's based in Shanghai, a former spokesperson for Daimler and Siemens and an HR strategist for Adidas. He founded the Urban Society Design Consultancy in Shanghai. Welcome, Christian. Hi, Nikolai. Good to see you again. Long How are you in Shanghai these days? Wonderful, I have to say. It's uh, probably the best place to be right now in China, in Shanghai. Uh, we're safe, business is booming. It's a bit cold, uh, actually, but otherwise blue skies and uh, the lovely city in every time of the year. That's good to hear. But give us a brief update on the COVID-19 situation right now in China. So I think China is uh, probably the most safe and stable country regarding COVID. I mean, after the initial uh, breakout, of course, we had the lockdown for a short while, uh, not more than uh, probably a month or so. And uh, then business has really gone back to normal. Life has gone back to normal. Uh, there's still a very strict control. Uh, with the QR code where really the digital ecosystem and the connected data really helps to keep everybody safe and stable here. So, for example, when you go into the subway or you go into like uh, the special office buildings, you have to uh, show your QR code, which updates in real time, uh, for example, by uh, just being green, that you're, that you're safe, that you're healthy. Um, so this gives everybody the assurance that, uh, you know, that people are under control, that, that it's safe to go. In the subway is actually mostly the place where you see everybody wearing a mask. Uh, everywhere else, business has gone back to normal since uh, at least six to uh, nine months now. And uh, yes, business is booming. Uh, Shanghai is alive, China is alive as uh, ever before, so it's uh, good to be here. You also lecture at the Alibaba Business School and another Chinese uh, business school. Um, what is the difference in teaching business matters nowadays in China and in Europe or the rest of the Western world? Well, uh, let's say there are two different uh, cases because First of all, I teach at the Alibaba Business School, the GDT, the Global Digital Transformation Program, working with over uh, 10 countries worldwide, uh, everything from Cambodia to Malaysia, Kazakhstan, uh, Rwanda, Mexico, Colombia, etc. Uh, so to help uh, young people, students in their digital entrepreneurship, learning from China, learning from the digital ecosystem, and how to apply it locally in their country. So this is uh, uh, driven by Alibaba. It's a very hands-on and a very practical uh, course. So which really, you know, enables people to learn and apply at the same time. So I think it's much more hands-on, it's much more practical uh, than compared to like the academic uh, programs in Europe and uh, on the West. And here, uh, the other program I teach at the Jiao Tong University, which is uh, one of the most renowned universities in Shanghai, where I teach the EBA program, the Executive Business Administration program. And this is really, uh, let's say, for... Uh, managers for executives worldwide. So half of my class is always from Shanghai, managers from international companies, from Chinese companies, a lot of German companies as well who do this uh, course on the side. But we also have students joining online 
uh, from all over the world. And there is also learning about, you know, business cases from Shanghai, learning about the future of work, future of organization, how is the world transforming, what is change management, what does that mean nowadays. Um, so these are two very different but very uh, uh, interesting uh, programs which I participate in and where I lecture. So, and what will the future bring for leadership management, for for board members, for for leadership personnel? Um, we experience now through to COVID nineteen that we have to cope with home office that we have to cope with more digitalization uh, at home and in business at school as well um, but that's just a little um, yeah little point which changed what will be the long-term change that you could see right now i think it's a very uh, complex topic because everything is connected and influences each other What we've experienced worldwide in different, ex to different extents, of course, is this radical change uh, to uh, working from home, working differently. So uh, the impact on, let's say, space, what, is, what does that mean for office spaces? What does that mean for urban environments? But what also, what does that mean to organizational change? And what does that mean for leadership? These are different topics we need to look at separately but in a connected way at the same time so i think it's very interesting to see that uh, i think what this uh, change in, with the pandemic has really triggered is to actually accelerate already existing change it's been a trend exploring more home office more work-life integration work-life balance already Uh, uh, since a few years, there's been a strong push towards digitalization, which has, of course, been accelerated through uh, the pandemic, through COVID. And this is where China, I think, really plays out the advantage of being the leading digital economy. They've had a lot of experience in that already. They've already digitalized uh, much more than most other countries. And I think it's also the, the population here, which is so ready to accept the digital world. So uh, you probably uh, uh, heard that, I mean, nobody here uses uh, paper money or currency anymore. Everything is really done through your app, your phone. I don't even recall when I've used money the last time. So if everything really just works through Alipay, uh, through WeChat and so on, all these mini programs, And of course, it's the population from children to the very old who use that. And, uh, this acceptance and the integration of digital gives China actually the, the advantage and the speed. And speed is actually one of the, the really uh, important criteria here as well, because uh, of course, the trends uh, which were there have also been accelerated. So the, the switch we had to switch more faster to online communication, online collaboration. Businesses have to adjust their model uh, to a world where you have to do things in a more digital way. So this pushes a lot of digital transformation in companies. Um, this is where, for example, I've been so incredibly busy over the last month um, and it's only getting more because more International companies are now pushing for this digital transformation in China as well, also to catch up with that. And uh, I think one of the important things uh, in this, what the first thing I always talk about is that digital transformation is not so much about technology. Digital transformation is really about people. And mm -hmm. it's much more about the culture change, the mindset change, the organizational change and how to lead this change um, from a, from, for the executive, for the managing uh, uh, director, for the, uh, the C-level people, how do CEOs lead this transformation and uh, cascade it through their organization. And what does this change mean for the training of leadership personnel? Um, do we have to go new ways there? Um, you are a specialist also in design thinking. Um, what is the new point to 
to bring people to adopt faster and quicker even with their with their with their attitude towards new technology and new change developments yeah well uh, as you said uh, one of the methodologies i use is actually design thinking uh, not always and sometimes just in different combinations but design thinking as you might know is is not about designing a product um or designing a service it's really more about the using the process to uh, really understand empathy to put yourself into the consumer shoes into the shoes of your target audience to identify their real pain points their real needs and desires and uh, this is where this is i think the strength of this methodology apart from uh, of course the part where you then ideate you come up to really brainstorm crazy ideas wild ideas and then rapidly prototype them to uh, really bring them to life in a very fast first way to test them and see what works and what doesn't i think the process of design thinking is is so powerful because of this uh let's say the process you go through as a leader as a leadership team or ideally even as a diverse team which i which i always try to uh recommend to bring together different people from the organization not only the leadership team but bring in some younger people bring in people who are critical to that bring in people from different departments different backgrounds different age groups to together collaboratively work on uh, imagining and developing this future together um it's really more i always say i'm 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 not a trainer uh i'm really a, i'm a facilitator because the real work is done by the participants by the participants themselves it's my job to bring that out to coordinate that to facilitate the journey of that and not tell them what to do most people they know what to do it's just bringing that out and bringing that in the process where um these qualities come up and one of the things for leadership especially uh is uh, to shift from this let's say top down leadership approach um the leaders like the boss to really switch into this empathetic leadership, where the leader is more a visionary uh is more a guide uh to uh, really focus on building a healthy company culture to build innovation to bring in diversity i think these are more the uh the, the jobs of leaders in the present and and the future so usually i had the impression that <clears throat> the asian culture especially the china culture is very hierarchically hierarchically ordered so um does that cause any problems with the traditional way you do business in china with this new with this new techniques with this new methods um well yes and no it does it can cause some friction um and this is why i mean it's it's changing as well because i think the one thing you uh, you really understand when you come to china is that everything actually is yin and yang so everything good always has a bad side and everything bad always has an opportunity like the corona virus like the like the pandemic right now and uh, and this is exactly how it is in china it it's never just black or white it's always both at the same time so when on the one hand in general especially the chinese companies are still more top down still more hierarchical at the same time uh in china it's this built in entrepreneurship and uh, agility which is so people are very very open to new ideas to try out new ideas um to really it's at the same time i think it's really a system of meritocracy at the same time where the best idea wins no matter where it comes from so uh and facilitating that and bringing that together is is what i so much enjoy and and love uh in the workshop i do here and the transformation center christian um you founded the urban society design consultancy what exactly are you teaching or training in there 
Well, um, I think this is, uh, I had this idea uh, already a few years ago, because uh, what's important for me is that everything which I do in my uh, transformation program, if it's, uh, you know, working with the Alibaba Business School or Jiao Tong University on more the academic side of things, or working with companies on very concrete business challenges, for me, it's important that we really try to put everything in a larger context of how does how do the things we do actually affect society? How does mm. it affect like the planet as well? So not just focusing, you know, on the narrow business impact on the short term goals, but really thinking larger. How does it affect families? How does it affect uh, cities in the future? What is the new responsibility of organizations in a social context? So this is why I try to also set an accent with uh, the, the company name to put it into a larger context of changing society uh, and having more of a social impact as well, not just business results. And are your clients there also businesses or also private persons? Uh, it's the whole range. It's, as I said, everything from academic organizations. Uh, I, I coach uh, uh, also leadership um, uh, executives here on a on a one to one basis. I coach a Finnish uh, startup company in Hangzhou, for example, on their growth and uh, company development. I also, I mean, with the Alibaba Business School, I help them with their business development as well, their global growth. Uh, strategy and um, it's, a, it's a large range of things I do so not only um, the business side, the academic side, one of the really exciting programs I'm working on, a project working on is that we're building a city in Nigeria um, in Africa now uh, together with Chinese investment, together with, uh, with Alibaba as well so really looking at the African continent um, and again, it's, I think everything is connected nowadays, and we can't just look at our business, our city, and even our country, because globally, uh, we are all connected, and everything we do here has an effect on, on other countries, on other people. And uh, I mean, it's always been my motto to rather look at what connects us as humans than to look at what separates us. Mm. And, uh, so I think that's something I'd like to remind everyone I work with uh, as well. Christian, um, what will be the outcome of the COVID-19 crisis in the end, in one or two years probably? Um, will there be stronger ties between nations and, and, and people and businesses? Or will it more be separated, more nationalism? That's a very big question, and uh, it's really, you know, uh, trying to look into the, the crystal ball, what's happening there. Uh, let's say, I, I think we can all contribute to a vision on how the world should look like in an ideal case. So I think it can, it can always go either way, but the more we are uh, all uh, dedicated and, and passionate in contributing to building a better world, the, the more we will achieve that. I personally think that, of course, on the one hand, there is a tendency to more authoritative uh, systems, uh, which is normal in times of crisis, that people you know, look for more a strong leadership uh, or stronger leadership and rather look for to be led. Um, and, uh, and on the other hand, that doesn't necessarily have to be bad. China is a good example of that because China has a very strong leadership, which is necessary to govern uh, a population of 1.4 billion people. You need, it's different than governing a company like, for example, Denmark with 6 million Danes. It's a lovely country, but it's not even, it's like a little district in Shanghai with 25 million people here. So there's no comparison. It's a different responsibility that a, a government has, and uh, you have to organize that differently. Now, in China, uh, with the uh, strong government of the last years, 
you do see, uh, uh, let's say, a, a, a kind of a nationalism come back. But I find that, and I mean, saying that as a German, I have to be very, uh, let's say, careful and responsible with this term. But I would say it's really a positive nationalism, which is which means being proud of the achievements of China, being proud to, you know, looking at the history of China, looking at the development of China, um, to really say uh, China is not less worth than the West, but it's really a strong leading country, leading trends, developing technology, leading in so many areas, uh, and doing a lot of good things there as well. So um, I think that, again, with yin and yang, it always has a positive and a potential negative side. Um, and I have to say, I am an optimist, and I prefer to focus on the positive side and make the world a more positive place as well. Kirsten, how about the future of the working place? We all learned now we have to be more in home office, um, the leadership um, also has to adopt to this situation. What does it mean for the future of the working place for the individual, but also for the companies and for the organization of companies? Uh, yeah, I think this is one of the biggest questions which everybody is asking, of course. Uh, and this is actually what I teach at Zhao Tong and Alibaba, future of work and the future of organizations. Um, I think it's what I find fascinating here is that uh, the, all the efforts and the thoughts are going in the direction that, um, of course, we should not, after this crisis is over, hopefully soon, that we're not going back to the old normal. That we should really use this opportunity to look at what, are, what can we learn from that? How can we really integrate change in a positive way? So how can we use the uh, the digital tools of, let's say, online conferencing, uh, connecting people, which is, I mean, which has been a, a, let's say, a necessity, and at first people hated that to say, you know, we can only be on Zoom all day and we don't see each other. The positive side of that, of course, is that we can uh, connect to everybody in the world uh, much easier and really learn that we can collaborate better together. Um, that we have to really look at what were the bad things in the offices that, that everybody hated? What was a waste of time? What was inefficient there? And how can we repurpose the space as a real physical collaboration space to build trust to, for example, to prototype, to create, but then look at how can we, you know, balance our time uh, being at home or looking at co-working spaces, looking at productivity hubs, uh, more in local areas, um, to really find a new way of, you know, working and living in a better way. So these are the things I'm working on. Uh, in my project, exploring that, prototyping that, um, developing, you know, how can we integrate technology in a human way into our life? So I think one of the examples, and you probably know that since a few years, I have this chip implant in my hand. So I have this, you probably can't see it, but I have an NFC chip implanted here. Um, with, with which I can open my door, I can uh, double authenticate my Bitcoin wallet, for example. Uh, I could pay, use it as a payment method and so on. But this is one example of how technology can be integrated even into our bodies. Um, but at the same time, uh, when I do workshops, I work very physically with people. I use improvisation theater, uh, with executives to really work on, let's say, the empathy part. To, uh, I, I let people draw and paint and, you know, build physical environments out of cardboard or Lego or paper, or whatever, to also bring in this haptical feeling, which mm. cannot be replaced physically. And I think it's really uh, bringing these things together seamlessly. What works best for humans on a digital side and on a physical side. I think that's, uh, that's exactly the direction we have to do more. So you think the new normal will not be 
always to be in the same office place, in the same office building, but to have more flexible structures where you meet different people in different parts of, let's say, Shanghai with 25 millions. Um, you have several offices then where several groups meet and yeah. you have also still a big chunk of home office. Exactly, exactly. And I mean, if you, again, what I mentioned in the beginning that this crisis is, has accelerated a lot of trends that were happening there before already. So if you look at the change of the job market through digitalization and automization, this will affect every single job. So not only a lot of jobs will disappear through digitalization, through AI, through robotics, and at the same time, new jobs will appear. But um, at the, I think what's important to realize that every single job will change, and that not only once, but all the time. So how, how do we change the workforce to uh, really go into an agile mode of permanently learning and adjusting? One important part about learning is, for example, unlearning. You have to sometimes get rid of old habits. You have to get unstuck. You have to question the things you learned 20 years ago, which might not be valid anymore, and learn new skills. And you have to change your behavior as well, because it's not longer relevant um, in a social context as well. So this constant change, um, or looking at the situation where I think in the future, if you look at younger people or how the job market is developing, that people won't just have one job and stick to that for 20, 25 years, um, but they might have two, three, four jobs at the same time and uh, you know, work for different people, like work for different organizations, work in different functions. Um, and I mean, this has a huge impact on how organizations are structured, how processes in organizations, how do you lead these people? Um, this is what I mean by looking at, you know, these concentric circles of how everything is connected and how everything impacts each other as well. So that means for the future that lifelong learning is absolutely necessary um, in the post-COVID area? Yes. Absolutely. Learning, education, self-development, that will be even more at the core of everything we do. Uh, and we need to do that faster, and we need to do that all the time, every single day. And I think it doesn't matter so much what you actually learn, uh, because, you know, there's an unlimited uh, offering of, of learning through YouTube. I'm learning the ukulele through YouTube right now. That's where you see that in my guitars and my ukuleles in the background. Um, you can learn on TED, uh, TED Talks. Uh, you can learn on, on, you know, the Udemy, the, the, all the digital learning platforms, mostly for free. Um, all the information is out there. And, uh, and I think it's really connecting your, you know, all the different skills. You're picking up new things exploring new possibilities and actually reinventing yourself at the same time. Are there any more topics you want to give us a, a point of view from your side, from the China perspectives towards Germany? Some hints uh, what the German should do better? Well, I mean, I always think both sides can learn from each other. So, uh, I mean, being a German, of course, uh, that's uh, being a German in China is very interesting because Germany is very, very highly respected and has a long tradition in China, not only in the academic field, in the in building the economy, uh, in, in in starting very early in in China, looking at Volkswagen, one of the companies I work with closely here, uh, having a long presence or Siemens, uh, you name it. Um, and uh, I mean, this uh, the German way of doing things in a very organized, very structured way, uh, the quality aspect of, you know, this made in Germany is something which China is right now developing with this China 2025 program, where they're actually really looking at the West, at Germany, and what can we learn from that? 
so many Chinese have studied in Germany uh, and bring back these values and try to integrate them into China as well. And at the same time, learning from China, from actually really this um, this agility of, of you know constantly adapting, learning, trying out things, uh, and then adjusting much quickly to the situation. I think this is something where probably the West and Germany can learn uh, to find the right balance here, to not always, you know, um, be afraid of the thing. Mm. I think when, when a lot of people uh, ask me, of course, what is the biggest difference between the West or between Germany and China uh, or America and China uh, with, the, with the trade war, etc., I think the biggest difference for me, apart from the fantastic food here, is, is really the mindset of um, being optimistic. In the West, I really see uh, a lot of you know, pessimism, a lot of negativity. And uh, this leads, of course, all this negative thought um, and this pessimistic thought leads to uh, these, these bad uh, experiences like, you know, the, the, the previous uh, the American administration, uh, Brexit, the right-wing swing of a lot of countries. This is all fear-based. And these are, let's say, these demographs uh, um, actually using that, using the fear of people to establish authoritarian systems. Now, in China, um, the general, let's say, mindset is really much more optimistic. And I think this is one of the main differentiators that basically almost every Chinese is an entrepreneur. Every Chinese thinks the future can be great, it's full of opportunities, and of course, if I work hard, if I do that, I can have this golden Lamborghini. And uh, so the mindset really makes a difference here. Instead of like, you know, oh, the future is bad. We have to be careful. We have to control it. Um, we have to go back to how we did things 100 years ago, this extremely conservative uh, attitude. I think this is really the differentiator which, which makes China faster, which makes China more agile and really more prepared for the future. A big discussion we have on um, the digitalization of uh, the public service. So um, in Germany, you have still go to the Amt for everything and fill out a form. How is that in 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 China? Is there more e-government al already? Uh, well, in China, it's again, it's it, I think that's a very good example for yin and yang because. A lot of things are really, uh, there's, there's almost everything you do through the app. I mean, it's really just one program. Uh, you, you take Alipay, uh, the Alibaba platform, and you can do everything through this one platform um, with, with just one touch. On the other hand, uh, there is, still is a lot of you know, bureaucracy. Uh, and, uh, for example, for my company, you always need the physical shop the the red stamp on every piece of paper you need to sign it and you need to send it by courier so uh, i mean again it's some some things are still very old fashioned and and then other things are, are super fast and futuristic this is like you know the balance which is still there but of course everything is digitalizing they are uh, china's very fast in adapting in changing things so i think that's uh, a great way to go what a great word at the end of our talk um, we learned a lot of what will connect us in the future um, how will leadership look like and how will the training for leadership look like thank you very much christian have a great time in china and hope to talk to you soon and all the best for you and your family Thanks, Nikolai. Hope to see you again personally as well, as soon as we can travel again. <laughs> Hopefully soon. Thanks right. a lot. Thank you.